As you heard, my name is Robert, and for the last seven years, I've been traveling around the world working with different humanitarian aid organizations. This has given me a lot of opportunity to do this, to sit down and talk with people about their ideas, their identity, and their issues. It's also given me a lot of opportunity to use these. These are a few of my old passports, and I've had to use these to cross boundaries. And that's what I want to talk about today, about, uh, about today. And I want to talk about how the boundaries we see in the world impact our lives and current events. So the first question is why boundaries? What's the point with all the lines on a map? And aren't we just trying to get rid of them? Isn't the goal to live in a utopia where we don't need boundaries, where I don't need my passports? I think the answer to that is maybe. <laughs> in order to answer this question for myself, I had to go back to my childhood, because that's where I learned a really important lesson about boundaries. You see, I had a sister who was four years older than me, and we had a playroom, and I had a dream. <laughs> my dream was to build the greatest Lego city that man had ever seen. I love Legos. I wanted to build the greatest city ever. Amazingly enough, this was not my sister's dream. <laughs> she wanted to have the greatest doll show that man had ever seen, and thus began the war of 1987. <laughs> Unfortunately, I ended up losing that war. I got a pencil lead in my hand, and there's three pound puppies that are still missing to this day. <laughs> so at this point, my parents stepped in, and they had the most elegant solution you could imagine, and it involved the greatest invention of mankind, duct tape. <laughs> what they did was they put a piece of duct tape on the floor and they said, dolls on one side, Legos on the other. And that piece of tape stopped the fighting between my sister and I. But why was there a fight in the first place? You see, it was a fight of identity, a fight of ideas. My identity, my, my idea, my dream of a Lego city, her dream of a doll show. So why did the boundary solve the problem? Boundaries foster peace, protect ideas, and give identity. You see, our ideas didn't change. I still wanted the Lego city. She still wanted the doll show. But the boundary allowed both of our ideas to exist. Without that boundary, my sister would have crushed my dream because she was bigger and stronger than me. But the boundary allowed my dream, my identity as a Lego builder to exist. It allowed both of our dreams to exist. And the truth is, the playroom example is played out around the world all the time. Unfortunately, there's not enough duct tape. <laughs> but what I want to do today is I want to look at three areas of conflict around the world and examine the boundaries that are there. Before we jump in, I want to say that this is not a pro-war or anti-war talk. This is a talk about boundaries and identity. So the first place, Afghanistan. You've probably heard of it. <laughs> but in order to understand the conflict of Afghanistan today, we have to understand how the boundaries came to be. So let's jump back hundreds of years to the first Persian Empire. And at this point, people were settling down. They were building their language, their culture, their identity. And for hundreds of years, they were solidifying these things. OK, now we're going to hop in the DeLorean. 88 miles per hour, all the way to the British Empire. Now the British rule. And the British had this very unique habit of setting down boundaries. They wanted to know where the British Empire was and where it wasn't. This is where we call them crumpets, and this is where they're cookies. Okay? And you would imagine, before going to set down an international boundary, that you would take lots of time to research all the factors involved and be meticulous before putting anything on paper. That's one way of doing it. <laughs> or you could call this guy, Mortimer Duran. <laughs> and I'm actually picking on him a little bit here. But he was a British officer tasked with setting down the boundary between British India and Afghanistan. So here's how the story goes. He sets up a meeting with the Emir, which was the leader of Afghanistan at the time. He rides into Kabul with one piece of paper. He starts to write on that piece of paper in English everything he wants, hands it to the Emir, the emir signs it. That piece of paper would become this boundary. It's called the Duran line. 
And that line, that piece of paper, would come to define two countries, Afghanistan and Pakistan. And you may be thinking, well, that, that's great. We've got countries now. Well, there's one other thing we need to look at. This is the ethnic map of the region. And if you look closely, you can see that the Duran line splits the Pashtun people group in half. So you have a people group that's had the same history and culture for hundreds of years, now split by one piece of paper. Now to complicate matters, you can see there's other ethnic groups there. In the blue, you have the Uzbek. In the purple, you have the Hazara, which have a traditional Shia Muslim view. And in the green, you have the Pashtun with a traditional Sunni Muslim view. Now, uh, you may be thinking about all these things, and you can see from it that there's a battle, a fight of identity. And one of those identities is the Pashtun. The Pashtun people group is split. Now, Hamid Karzai, the president of Afghanistan, who is also Pashtun, said that the Duran line was a line of hatred that built a wall between two brothers. Okay? And so it's pretty crazy when you start to think about it, but part of the problem in Afghanistan is this battle, this fight of identity. And it shows us that conflicts come from threatened identity and lack of boundaries. I think we're going to see this even more in the next place we go, and that's Iraq. <laughs> now, modern-day boundaries in Iraq came from uh, a thing called the League of Nations, which is not a superhero group, uh, even though it sound like it. After World War I, the League of Nations split up the Ottoman Empire, and that's how we get most of our modern-day boundaries for Iraq. Now, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to look at the people groups. So the first one in green here is the Kurdish. And literature will say that the Kurdish people group is one of the largest people groups in the world without their own country. They spread from Turkey to Syria, Iraq, and into Iran. Now, they are Muslim, but they're not Arab, okay? Now, the next group we're going to look at is the Shia Muslims in the south. And if you know your Middle East history, you'll know that Iran is predominantly Shia, and you'll know that Iran and Iraq had this little thing called a war, <laughs> so there's some tension there. And the third group is a minority of Sunni Muslims. But they were in power for a long time. And Saddam, when he ruled, he disliked these other groups so much that he actually began to attack them. So in 1988, he gassed a city in the Kurdish area, and he killed 5,000 people in one day. Uh, pretty horrific. Mothers were baking bread, and they died as they were baking bread. Saddam also disliked the Shia, and he sent jets to do strafing runs down in the south. So you can see there's definitely some conflict there. So after Desert Storm, the U.S. sets up two no-fly zones, one in the north to protect the Kurds, one in the south to protect the Shia. Fast forward a few years past that, the wars are over. Saddam's now gone, but the Kurdish people still don't have their own country. So they do something interesting. They set up something called the Kurdish Autonomous Region, also known as Kurdistan. And this is a very unique place in the world because it's self-governing. They have their own government, their own police force, but they're still part of Iraq. And so the government of Iraq has officially recognized them, and by doing this, they've given themselves space, and they've actually done really well. This is the GDP from 07 to 09 of Kurdistan, and you can see it just continues to go up. And that trend has continued till today. So by giving themselves this boundary, they've given themselves success in a lot of ways, especially financially, even more than the rest of Iraq. So, the third area, Sudan. Modern-day Sudan looks like this, and you may be thinking, well, there's a lot of ethnic groups in Sudan, and you would be absolutely right. But there's something that gives identity maybe even more than ethnicity, and that's religion. So here we see the religious breakdown. You have Muslims in the north, and you have Christians and animists in the south, and since we're here at TED, you guys obviously watch the news, these groups fight a little bit, okay? <laughs> But recently in Sudan, there's been some peace. So where's that peace come from? It's come from a boundary. The black line split Sudan into two separate countries, North Sudan or Sudan, and South Sudan. Now, it's not just along religious lines, and it's a lot more complicated than that. But that boundary has brought peace to the area, and that boundary has given each group their own identity. So what's the answer? Do we just give every ethnic group their own country? Well, that's a answer, but I don't think that's the answer. Uh, a country like Nigeria has hundreds of ethnic groups, and if each of them had their own country, it'd basically be like you know, medieval city-states, 
And we don't really want to go back to those days. <laughs> so I think there's another answer that we can see if we look at a couple areas. So let's go back to Sudan. We now have two separate countries. They're a little more isolated, a little more fragmented. How do we get these countries to work together and prosper? Let's look at the resources. If you look in the south, there's oil. The south controls most of the oil fields, but the pipes in the port are in the north. So recently, September of last year, these two countries, who hated each other, sat down and signed an agreement to let the oil flow from the south to the north. It's possible. Countries that dislike each other very, very much can work together. It's just really hard. <laughs> and recently, there's been some setbacks to this agreement. So I think there's one other area that we can look at that might exemplify this even better, and that's the EU. Now, you may be thinking, according to the current economic crisis, that the EU is not a success, but I want to explain one way in which I think it is. If you look at this map, you're going to see a lot of boundaries, a lot of borders. But each country has recognized that it's in their interest to work together to have a better economic standing than to be separate. It's an example of having a boundary that gives a national identity, but crossing that same boundary for your benefit and everyone else's. And I think this is one of the reasons that the EU won the Nobel Peace Prize. It's an example of setting down your differences to benefit yourself and those around you. It shows us that mutual interest and respect bridge boundaries. And I think the lesson is this. Boundaries are a tool that should be used when all other types of diplomacy fail. But the goal is not to build walls to keep people out. The goal is to set down boundaries to protect identity and give people a chance to see that they need each other. We must get people to look past the boundaries of country, religion, ethnicity, while still protecting those same identities. Because the truth is this, everyone wants an identity. It's a basic human need. So how do we set down boundaries to protect those identities but still encourage cooperation. And this isn't just in world politics. This is in your workplace, your home, your life. When your identity is secure, it's only then that you can work on cooperation. And this is true with ethnic groups as well. When a group's identity is secure, they can work from that place of security on cooperation. It's a slower process, but it's a better one. Because we all say we want peace. I'll say this, peace is easy. Peace is easy if your definition of peace is the absence of war. A strong dictator can lock up anyone that disagrees with them, and there will be peace in that country. But that's not the kind of peace we're talking about, is it? The peace we're talking about has an underlying qualifier that says everybody gets to keep their own identity, but still live in harmony and work together. That peace is a lot harder, and that peace requires some boundaries and respect. And I think, going back to this, mutual interest and respect will bridge boundaries today, just like it did years ago when I was a kid in a playroom. You see, after weeks of playing on my side, I realized I would never have the Lego city I wanted because I didn't have the know-how to build it. And after weeks of my sister playing on her side, she realized that she would never have the doll show she wanted because she didn't have the manpower to put it on. So we figured it out. I'll help you with your doll show this week, if next week you help me build the Lego city. And if I can say, it was the greatest Lego city ever. <laughs> <laughs> and my hope is that if we can learn it in the playroom, then we can do it in the world. Thank you very much. <laughs>